Good morning, Rush Church. It is great to see you all here this morning. If you'd like to stand and join us, we're going to get started off singing Who You Say I Am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all oh, his love. Ransom me. 
Well, let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you. We love you for who you are. We thank you that you have granted us eternal life through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, as we always do. We thank you for right now, this day, this morning, this moment, that we come together as friends and family, loved ones by you, loved by each other, and that we can look around and know that we are wanted and cared for, that we have certainty for the future in Jesus Christ, that we get to sing praises to his name as a foreshadowing of, of this wonderful glory that is to come. We thank you, Father, that we know who you are and you know us. What a blessing it is to be here with these people in this place on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated for just a minute. Good to see you today. Uh, a couple things. Get my microphone off and get my ears on. Thank you very much. I was hoping you would notice. I warm for you, John. Did John say that? Aha, uh -huh, yes, it was. Uh, actually, I've had them for a little while, but I, I just I don't wear them very often. A um, couple things to remember. Number one, connection cards. Connection cards on the back of your bulletin. Uh, if you're if you're a guest with us, I do encourage you to fill that out and put that in the offering plate. It makes me a, it makes it a lot easier for me to track everything that you do. Uh, but if there is information in your own life that has changed, maybe your address has changed, maybe your phone number, something like that, please please update the church with that. Uh, I've noticed that as we're preparing for the church directory and everything, that some of that stuff has lapsed. And so if that's changed, please fill that out and drop that uh, in, the, uh, in the offering plate. Also, I hope your pictures went well. Uh, I've, I heard that some of them did, and I, I heard that some not, not, didn't, you know. So we'll see how that goes, how that turns out. But, uh, but I don't take a good picture, as Ben knows, right? I've got to be in 3D. Um, I've never actually had a photographer in the middle of a session tell me that I'm a, I'm a lost cause. Uh, ben did that with our, our, our pictures for our engagement pictures, right? And I think he was going to quit. He was going to stop. He's like, I can't believe this. This is a mess. Um, Trunk or Treat's happening this coming Saturday from 3 to 5 at the uh, ballpark. So make sure you're there. Guys, there's no rain contingency plan for this, okay? So if it rains, that's it. We go home. Uh, I, Tammy said there's still probably going to be kids there wanting candy. Just honk and wave as you go out, you know. You know, just see ya. We're out of here. Uh, that would be mean. Uh, also, there's the family fest, the fall family fest coming up on the seventh. This is going to be back here, uh, at church kids and, and and their friends. We've got a few volunteers for this. It's just a fun time in the afternoon. We're gonna have some pumpkin uh, painting. We're gonna have that campfire and some s'mores, some scarecrow making. I mean, just all kinds of stuff back here on the seventh of November, and that's from 1 to 4, I think, in the afternoon. So bring your kids out and have a good time with that. Also, Thanksgiving, we are going to try to do this. Okay, Now, we usually seat 200 people per serving in the foyer. We're not going to do that this year. We're going to seat 150 people per serving in the foyer and in here. We're going to utilize both of these spaces and any space in between that we can. Um, it's going to be a little bit harder to set up and tear down but for everybody else, I think it's still going to be a good time if you want to dine with your family. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's weird, it's different, you know, but everything's weird and different right now. Uh, so that's what we're doing, what we're doing there. Um, but I wanted you to just have a, have a moment here because, uh, uh, I, and again, I don't want to spoil, I don't want to ruin your, your worship time. Uh, I hope we didn't do that last time. In fact, I think it kind of enhanced it. Uh, but little Quentin in Kenton has, has not been found yet. A uh, little boy that went missing. And uh, it was hard to get through last service, hard to get through this one. Um, you know, he's, he's four, four. Uh, and this is day four that he's been gone. Um, so I just want us to have a, a time of prayer for him, his family. Uh, Dave is there now searching, right? The, the, he does underwater searching, uh, diving in a team, uh, searching the river and things like that. Uh, we don't know yet. Everybody's still holding out hope. Uh, I got a chance to talk to some of their, the people that knew him, some of their, uh, uh, well, just some of the people around town that knew him. Um, but everybody's still looking for him, and, and uh, well, we'll see how that turns out. But uh, His name's Quentin. 
His name's Quentin, okay? So just, you may not know his face or his family. Just think Quentin, and we'll, we'll just, we'll talk to God, okay? Father, we thank you for Quentin. We thank you for a very precious, very, very precious, very beautiful creation. Um, and Father, as, as, as these things happen, first of all, as we already have this morning, we know and we, we acknowledge that you are good. This doesn't change that in our minds and in our hearts. And we, we want to we wanna stay there. We want to know that. Um, but Father, we also know that we live in a world that, that is not running the way it's supposed to that it is a fallen world, and with that comes sadness and tragedy and hardship. Uh, Father, we know that you don't hate us, and, and you certainly don't hate this, this beautiful, beautiful creation of Quentin. Um, and so, Father, we ask that, uh, that you help find uh, this little boy, that you find him. And again, as, as one of your, your sons is there, as David's there, that you will open his eyes as he works that you will open their ears as they work, that you will give the family peace as they work through this, Father, um, through, a, through, a, through, through a torture I don't know. And Father, we don't want to know. We, we ask that we don't experience that. Uh, but Father, we do ask that uh, your will, your desire is done in this boy's life and in his family. We ask this. Uh, through Jesus. We ask this in the name of the power of Jesus. Jesus is my Savior. He is my King. He is your Son. We ask this in Jesus' name, that he will be saved, that he will be recovered, Father. Uh, however that happens, however that means. Most importantly, though, Father, however this turns out, do not, do not let, strengthen the faith. Do not let the, 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 the faith of people who who love you and know you, do not let that falter. Do not let them, them give up knowing that you are good and bad things happen in a bad world. Father, we ask for his protection. We ask now that if he is there, that you will protect him, will warm him, people will see him or hear him. We thank you, Father, that we can talk to you like this. Help us to have have faith. We trust you. Regardless of what happens, we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. thought by now they fall, but you have never failed me yet, waiting for change to still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me We'll sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again.
this morning as um, we were gathering on the worship team, getting ready to, you know, worship this morning with you guys, and we were praying for Quentin, and we were praying for the situation, we were praying for Dave, and, you know, we choose these songs for our sets before Jesus comes, and God knew that this was going to happen. He, he, there's nothing that is hidden from God, and so this morning, we were practicing, we were singing these songs, we're like, yes, this is our prayer. These are, these songs are words to him this morning that he is a way maker. He is a light in the darkness. He is controller of everything. And this morning as we continue to worship, let this be our prayer. Let this be our prayer for Quentin. Let this be our prayer for this nation. Let this be our prayer for our family. I worship you, 
morning. Thank you. You know, I'm always excited when I get up here to stand because I've always wanted to do something, but like uh, John makes it no fun because he's booked. Like he's only got a single page of notes for me. I swear I would at least make one page show today, but I'll be nice. I'll leave that alone tonight. Don't worry about it. But again, Welcome, and we are glad that you are here. We move to the point in our service that we make this our signal page for the week. As I've mentioned, I love this part of the service, um, that we as believers in Jesus get to participate in his body and blood. If you haven't been here in a while, you remember Miss Corwell passed the cups around here a little bit. She's up to the point, uh, the one 
just one, take up one step and accept the bread and the, the juice that I share this morning. And we invite all believers in Jesus to participate with us. And uh, But, you know, I always want to share a few thoughts that just help prepare us for when it's ready to take communion together. As I've been looking back at some of the things that I've shared over the last couple months, I realize there's kind of a theme with the things that I've been talking about. And if I were a uh, preacher and say this was a communion meditation series, I probably would label the series Adventures in Missing the Point. Because that's kind of what it is for me, is I get focused on so many other things, I forget to focus on what's really the most important. And that's what I want to make sure that we do as we prepare for communion. Today's no exception in that. Uh, I've really been enjoying the series that uh, John has been preaching for four years practically. I've been, uh, you know, God has clearly been speaking and teaching me through some of the words and challenging me in a lot of those ways. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, one of the, I want to share a story and just kind of a, some of the, the implications of this. And one of the things that John talked about is when you're doing discipleship, when you're doing discipleship right, discipleship can get messy if it's not treated with grace. And I want to share with you a story by the, uh, that was actually uh, not something that happened to me, but happened to a guy named uh, Matt Stanley. He's a pastor in a church called the Village Church north of Dallas. And the story happens when he was in college. Uh, he was in an English class, a Jewish Christian, and uh, he was started talking to the person he's sitting beside him. She was a single mother. She had a really tough life. In fact, uh, you know, she was having a few things happen in her life. So the, her current uh, boyfriend happened to be married to someone else. And uh, she had a couple kids from just her father's. And she was really struggling. And uh, Matt began sharing with her and talking to her and developing a friendship. And he got to explain to her who Jesus was and what grace was all about. And just like John had been mentioning in the series, the first step in a lot of that is come and see. And he kind of did that in a little sneaky way where he invited her. Well, he said, but hey, I've got a friend in a band. If you want to come be my friend in this band, you just happen to be in the worship band at a church. So she agreed and decided to come to church for the first time with more than a, a group of friends. And during that church service, uh, they got to see their friend play. And it was great. Matt ended up taking him up to begin to share. I won't go into a lot of the details of how he even talked about the kids. But the, the subject of his sermon was really sexual purity. And I'll tell you that there's a lot of good things that the Bible teaches on that, that subject. A lot of things that all Christians need to realize. Something that God is concerned about. I'm not saying that all those things aren't good, they aren't important. But that's not what this guy was talking about in his particular sermon. And, of course, Matt was a little concerned just based upon who he, he invited. He wanted to make sure that this person heard the gospel message. And I'll, I'll suffice it to say the gist of the sermon was something to the effect of, don't want to get an STD, do you? So he's a little disappointed. He's a frustrated man. And what this pastor did was at the beginning of the sermon, he brought up a rose. He smelled the rose. He admired the rose's beauty. And uh, he said, you know, you, everyone needs to experience this. And so he goes around and he gives the rose out to, to some of the audience. He invites them to pass the rose around the entire church so everyone can smell it and admire the rose's beauty. So the rose went around, and by the time he was almost finished with his sermon, he asked for that rose back. And there he held that rose. And, of course, after everyone had handled the rose, it was, you know, most of the petals had fallen off. The thing was crooked. You know, it lost all the leaves. He could barely recognize it from the rose that, that he started out with. In his big crescendo, the main point of his sermon was, he held up the rose. He said, now who would want this? Just look at this rose. Who would want this rose? And he remembered thinking, and he's sitting there, and he's sitting there eating it, and thinking, just all the self-control he had in him not to stand up and yell, Jesus wants the rose. You see, that's what it's all about. 
Jesus wants the road. It's the point of the gospel. Jesus came to earth for that road. He became sin to win a sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. And yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And to miss that point is to miss what we are all about. Jesus wants that road. So my prayer for myself and my prayer for you today is that we recognize who we are, who we were, and who we are in Christ. The difference that he made, the sacrifice that he made for you. And my other prayer is that we see the failure to help what that road is. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that you are who you are. Uh, Father, that you sent your son to die in our place to make sure that we didn't get what we deserved. Father, that uh, help us to realize the importance of what you did on the cross. Help us to realize that this is the most crucial thing of our lives and the point of why we are here. Help us to hear this this week in all that we do. We just pray this all in your name. than we had last service, all right, it's the way it goes. I do appreciate, though, what Luke had to say. I appreciate that so much. That was a, a wonderful uh, reminder of the point of the gospel message, the point of Jesus Christ. We can't overcome sin on our own. We can't save ourselves, and the whole point of Jesus dying for you and for me is that he essentially stands for us, represents us. 
and I, I couldn't help but think I couldn't help but think about two things. Um, one, why doesn't why doesn't why don't people realize what Jesus did? Why don't people realize that the work is done? Well, why doesn't everybody just then say okay, say yes? The work's done. The death is done. It's on the cross. Your, 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 your value is the fact that God himself would die for you. Can we just say okay and be done with it? Can we just say yes and move on with life? I wish, I wish that were the case with everybody. That's the first thing I know. second thing I know is I got to laughing because uh, I was just watching, kind of listening out of my listening, kind of watching out of the corner of my eye, uh, Randy and... Uh, and, and Theron and, and uh, uh, Troy and everybody in the back, and they were, doing, they were doing communion. And then I was listening to the kids in the student room, and I was listening to Darren and, and Nate talking in the hallway. And, and it, it is very much in this place, and I, and I want you to be a part of it. It is very much this brother, sister, we don't live under the same roof throughout the week. Um, but you got you got brothers and sisters in this place, and and I hope that you begin to feel that. I hope you begin to know that. And um, if if maybe you haven't worshipped with us for a long time, that grows on you pretty quick, actually. Um, and uh, I hope you take I hope you take part in that. It's a wonderful thing to experience. Um, I'm gonna do I have to do this service a little bit different than I did the other service. Let's see if I can recruit maybe Brian and Cliff for a second. Um, should have about 15 of these in each one. If you have a bulletin, if it's physically in your hand, can you lift it up? If you physically are holding on to a bulletin, can you? Okay, so everyone who does not have a bulletin, can you see if they get one of those cards? That's pretty much all I needed. And while they're doing that, I had all these cards set up in the first service, but, um, well, they used them all, and I didn't make enough for everybody, so that's just the way we're going to have to do it well polished around here that's the way we do it right well i appreciate again what luke had to say we've been talking about the importance of discipleship making in fact i really i, I want to change that it really hasn't even been the importance of discipleship making throughout the whole series it's really also the importance of your spiritual growth growing in maturity in christ you start with the lost, that's the first chair. You move to the believer, that's the second chair. Then you move to the worker or servant, that's the third chair. And finally, the disciple maker, that's the fourth chair. And again, all of this comes from Dan Spader's book, Four Chair Discipling. I do encourage you to read it. There's going to be some things you like and some things you don't like uh, because it's it's not scripture. Well, if it is scripture, there's some things you like to hear and some things you don't like to hear even in scripture. This is not the Bible. It is a commentary uh, on a subject in scripture, but I encourage you to read it yourself. Uh, actually, today there's a part that uh, Dan Spader talks about that I don't particularly agree with, uh, and I'll mention that when we get to that place um, in the message. But uh, we started off with realizing that Jesus is human. And I know this might sound foreign to, to the world around us. See, they, they, the world around us wants to put Jesus in one of two categories, either divine and not human, or human and not divine. One of the two. That's the only place he can fit. And, and that's simply not the case. That's not reality. Jesus is divine. He is a sovereign over his creation. But he is also fully human, as human as you and as human as me. The things you wrestle with, church, he wrestled with. And I'm talking about the mental things, the emotional things, the, the things you're challenged with. He was also challenged with. He is as human as you are. He's also God. He's also fully God, even though... He is a part of the triune God, so you figure all that stuff out, you let me know, okay? And then I'll be able to teach on that. I, if you figure out how Jesus was able to accomplish all of that. The point is, though, he is fully human, as fully human as you 
and as me. So as he lays out challenges to you and to me and to his disciples in Scripture, we cannot scoff at that. We cannot shrug our shoulders and say, well, he's God and I'm not. He's clearly not talking to me. No, he's a human being. In fact, his humanity really, I think, came home, really hit home when we realized four or five or six weeks ago, and we were talking about the humanity of Jesus, there are things, specific, specifically, specific things that you know more about than Jesus did during his ministry. Do you know that? I, I mean, if, 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 if you ask Jesus to tear down and rebuild a 350, he's going to say, I can't. I don't know how to do that. That's what he would have said during his ministry. I mean, that's, that's human right there. He learned and he grew, yet he was also divine. I wouldn't know how to do that yet either. I'm getting there. Don't worry. It'll get there. Joe's got an engine for me. I've just been putting it off for a while. You know why I want to learn? Actually, that fits. You know why I want to learn how to tear one down? I want to be able to teach Sam. That's why we want to learn, right? That's why we want to grow. So we can teach somebody else. So we can pour into somebody else and somebody else grow up, raise up, produce fruit, bear fruit, and maybe teach somebody else. Other people continue to know and grow. But Jesus is human. And because Jesus is human, we can be challenged with these various steps in our walk with Jesus Christ, all culminating in making disciples. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you've given us a tremendous gift of worship and of, of, of knowledge, of learning, of understanding. We thank you that we can be challenged, Father. We thank you also that you, you have, you've granted us this gift to actually be workers, to be players on this board. We thank you, Father, for that tremendous challenge and, and, and tremendous fulfillment. We ask today, Father, that you help us to fully understand this desire you have in your heart for our lives, that we would respond to it and that would build up your kingdom here, now, in Russellvania or around the world and for eternity. We thank you, Father, for all that you are, for who you are, for what you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 1 eventually. John chapter 15. A quick recap of the things we've been talking about. And I don't have the chairs up here because we had our band up here and, and we'd be stumbling around for six or seven, five or six weeks. So we don't have actual chairs up here. However, we've been talking about four chairs. First of all, the first chair, this is where most of the people are in life. Most of the people you ever come in contact with are in chair one. That's the lost. That's those who have not accepted the truth of Jesus. They haven't realized yet that the work's done for them. The battle's fought for them. The war's already won for them. For a moment, if we could learn something about Jesus, or for a moment, if we could perhaps set aside pride, or maybe it's worry or fear, if we could set that aside for a moment and accept this wonderful gift of Jesus Christ, we move from the lost to the believing chair. But sadly, the majority of people you will come in contact with throughout life are lost. They haven't given their life, their mind, their heart over to Jesus. And I'm not just talking about giving their service. Ironic, isn't it, how we can give our service over to Christ, but we can't give our mind and our hearts over to Jesus. And there's many people that refuse to do that. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's not knowing. Sometimes it's ignorance. And that's this first chair. How do we minister to people who are lost? How do we minister to people who don't even know who Jesus is? We've talked about this. This is these three words, come and see. Come and see. And church, I want that to be on the tip of your tongue. If you're going to be the church in Russellvania, Ohio, if you're going to be Rush Church, it ought to be built into you, be growing on the tip of your tongue, the tip of your heart, the tip of your fingers. Hey, come and see. What do you know about Jesus? Not a whole lot more than you do, but I know where he lives. Come and see. Come and see where Jesus lives. That's really the invitation. Come and see where Jesus stays. Remember, that was the invitation that he gave to the disciples. Rabbi, where are you staying? He said, come and see. Where does Jesus live? Where does Jesus stay? It could be here, this place, 
these minds, these hearts on Sunday morning. This could be the come and see. Hey, man, just come and see where Jesus is. Maybe it's around your dinner table. That's a great place. I want to tell you, I know that Jesus lives around my dinner table. Why don't you come and see where Jesus lives? Can we make such a claim? Can we say that? Absolutely we can, and we should. We don't say it enough. Come and see where Jesus lives, and then it's around your table in a conversation. Come and see where Jesus lives, and maybe it's, maybe it's fishing out by the lake. Come and see where Jesus lives, and maybe it's you and one other person having lunch and having a conversation. Is Jesus living there? Absolutely, because he lives in the believer in Jesus Christ. He's a part of me. Come and see where Jesus lives. And to invite someone to this family, right, his brothers and sisters. I just, I just love it. When you, when, you, when you sit back and you just watch people operate, see what their interaction, to invite them to be a part of this and say, hey, look, man, just come and see where Jesus lives. What do I have to do? You don't have to do anything. Just come and see. Just, just watch them interact. Just watch Jesus interact throughout his church and throughout his body. Just come and see. And then we come and see and we get to know Jesus a little bit. We get to know, really more to the point, his ambassadors. That's you. The people who believe in Jesus, ambassadors for Christ. That's our mission. That's our goal. This is what Jesus looks like. They get to know Jesus. They get to know who he is, who he was. They get to know a little bit more about him through scripture. They get to know his character. What's this guy stand for? Love. Love above everything else. Yeah, there's other things. There's peace and joy and there's self-control and there's forgiveness and there's all kinds of things. But love is what he stands for. And so they're getting to know Jesus. And finally, the gospel message works upon their heart. The Holy Spirit literally convicting the heart of the one who hears the message. And they come to accept this as truth. Their eyes are open. They say, look, the work's already done. The war's already won. Why am I still fighting? I believe in this guy. Guess what? You've just become a believer in Jesus Christ. And now you've moved from chair one to chair two. And that's something to celebrate because you are no longer the old person. You are an eternal person. Built for forever. No longer allowed to have the fear of death. I'll tell you, you can be scared of a lot of things in life, and there's a lot of things that kind of fill our minds and our hearts. Can we just get that out of the way? Can we just, if you believe in Jesus and you're fearing death, stop doing that. Just kick that out of the way because you don't have to be afraid of death anymore. You don't have to be afraid of what's next after you put your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ. No more being afraid of death after we put our lives in the hands of the life giver, okay? We've just freed up a lot of time. No more fearing death. I'm not going to spend my time doing that. A lot of people are still scared about dying. I don't blame you. I mean, it, the process of it is sometimes painful, right, for people who are dying and people who are still alive. But don't fear death if you believe in Jesus. Stop, stop. Stop doing that. Jesus has saved us for all eternity. You become a believer in Jesus, a wonderful thing. What do you do when you're a believer in Jesus? You follow him. First, you've just kind of to see who he is, but now you believe in him, and you're beginning to follow, you're beginning to read, you're beginning to study, you're beginning to understand, you're beginning to say why you believe what you believe. You're beginning to live out what you profess. Before you were following Jesus, before you were, or before you were just coming to see who he was, now you're following. Now you're living out the gospel message. Sometimes when we ask people, we call people, we talk to people about following Christ, the first thing out of their mouth is, okay, what do you want me to do? Nothing. You're following. We'll be working pretty soon. Right now, we're just following. I mean, even Scripture says that as it talks about people who want to be overseers in the church. Paul talking to Timothy, he says, they should not be a recent convert. Why? Because they're not there yet. They're not working yet. Let them follow for a little bit. To understand the gospel, to understand Jesus, to understand his church, to put into practice the things that they hear. Yes, practice, practice the things that they hear, to be refined, to be sanctified, to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. I don't know why I'm looking at my notes. Nothing I've said so far is on the notes, all right? We're getting there, hopefully. And then you go from, you could have taken the notes today, Luke. 
How do I know it was your birthday? I would not have made fun of you profusely when you walked in the door earlier this morning, by the way, okay? You go from believing in Jesus, and if you're anything like me, if you're anything like a lot of people in this room, after you go from believing in Jesus long enough and following Jesus long enough, eventually there's something inside your mind, your heart that says, I want to do more. I want to do more. I don't know what yet. I don't know where and I don't know how yet. All I know is I want to do more. I see people every day when I wake up walking out into the vineyard, and here I am following. I, I, I think I can do that. I think I could actually be on the team. Right now, I'm the understudy. I want to be on the team, right? I think I can go out and, and bring in the harvest. And how do I bring in the harvest? Again, that come and see ought to be on the tip of our tongue. Come and see. Are you making a disciple? No, you're not. But you're inviting people to come and see. You're helping out. You're working inside the church and inside the body. You've wrapped your arms around a particular ministry that's very, very important. I can't think of a ministry here that's not important. There's not a single thing that we do that I think to myself, boy, I'd love to get rid of that. And wrap your arms around areas to serve. And you might start here in the church. I want to know what it feels like to be a worker. And then from there, you might actually go out into the harvest field and talk to a stranger. And invite them to come and see. Get to know who they are. What do you know about Scripture? I want you to answer this question, this question, this question, this question before I go to your church. I can't do that. I'm a worker. I want you to just come and see. There's going to come a time as I learn and I grow in Jesus Christ that I will be able to answer all those questions you have. But right now, why don't you just come and see where he lives? This is what workers do. Workers bring in the harvest. It's great to be a worker. And there's a lot of workers in this place. There's a lot of servants. Call them servants. Call them whatever you want. That's that chair of three. And finally, after chair of three, you move to chair four. What is chair four? Chair four is the person looking inwardly. They say to themselves, they look at their heart, they look at their mind, and they say, I understand now who Jesus is. Yes, who Jesus is, who and what life is, how he interacts in it, how he interacts in my life, my role in this life. How I go through life is through the veil of the scriptures. Everything that comes in is through the filter of the Holy Spirit. I, I surround my life by Jesus Christ while he's even at the center. I mean, it's an incredible experience. It's an incredible way when you get to this definition of who you are. I am a follower of Jesus. I'm a pursuer of Christ. There's an incredible peace that comes up in your, your mind, your heart. There's incredible joy. Good things all the time? No way. But there's still joy. There's still peace in the midst of chaos. And hopefully there's people around you that look at your peace and your joy and they say to themselves, I want what he's got. I don't know what it is, but he's got purpose, she's got mission, she's got value, he's got peace, he's got joy. Where are you getting that? It's an incredible trust that we have in Jesus. After we look in, we say to ourselves, I want someone else to feel what I feel, to see what I see, to know what I know. I want other people to follow Jesus the way I follow Jesus. I want people to understand Jesus the way I understand Jesus. You're ready to make a disciple. You're ready to be with someone in their lives, helping, leading, guiding, as others guide you. You're making a disciple in Christ. Sometimes it's helped through life experience. Sometimes it's helped through spiritual experience. But you're bearing fruit. Yeah. You're having kids, as it were. You're a parent now, or a grandparent now, because people are coming to know and understand Christ through you. You are reproducing. It's an incredible place to aspire to be. Jesus gives us, in John 15, a summary of his expectations for his disciples and everybody in the church. But before we do that, the first challenge is this. You should have either a bulletin with a sermon notes section or a card, one of the two. should have both, one of those. One, doesn't have to have be both, should it be one of those. Now, hopefully, in or around you or in front of you, there's also a pen. I want you to have a pen because we're going to do this right now. I've got 
one. You pass this round, go on. Break it down. And you're either going to participate in this or you're not. I mean, it's either something you want to do or something you don't want to do, because I'm telling you, it's going to become very real here in a second. I'm not going to tell you where you are. In your walk with Christ, I'm not going to tell you where you are. I'm not going to tell you if you are lost or if you're a believer or if you're a worker in the vineyard or if you're ready to make disciples, if you're ready to reproduce your faith in Jesus. You're going to tell you where you are. Because when you actually have to confront it and write it down, suddenly it's not me that you can dismiss. I know you do it. I know you do it. Goes in one ear and out the other, right? By the way, I have a lot to learn about raising a son. You know what I said yesterday about a six-year-old boy? We were in the barn. We were working on some stuff. And Ashley asked me if I was watching Sam. And these words came out of my mouth. Sweetie, what harm can he possibly do? shameful. I've got a long way to go. So you know where we're going with this. You got to look at some stuff. You got to look at that mirror that's right in front of you. And you got to write down, what do you say? What, what are you? Write it down. Where are you? Lost? A believer? A worker? Or a disciple maker? Because you can't ignore it anymore. I can't ignore it anymore. I already wrote mine down the first service. I told them I was going to write it down in this service. I haven't written anything down yet. That's the truth. I will. You can't ignore anymore. There is a maturity in Christ that Jesus calls all of us to. The Christian walk is more, church, than just existing until we die. There is a progression there that leads us into building and adding to the kingdom of God. And at some point, we've got to make a decision that I believe in Jesus and I'm following Jesus, but I aspire to do more, to build the kingdom, to go out into the harvest field. And after I've done that, I even want to reproduce this incredible faith and love that I have for Jesus Christ, and I want to reproduce it in somebody else. What are you? Are you lost? Are you a believer? Are you a worker? Are you a disciple maker? Now, if you're a lost or if you are a disciple maker, I really, in all seriousness, I do want you to talk to me. You need to call the church. I need to call you. We need to sit down. I want to have, I want to have a conversation uh, because we are going into some challenging things in our disciple making process that Cliff and Brian and not Luke and I talked about on Wednesday. He missed the meeting. He was too busy celebrating early birthday or something. But we are going into some serious things with discipleship making. Uh, so if that's where you are, I need you to talk to me. If you're lost, I want to talk to you about Jesus. I, I want to help you to understand the simplicity of it. Yes, it's huge throughout life, and it's huge for your life. But I want you to be able to see Jesus, see the gospel message the way I do. Now, it doesn't need to be this, this, this monster that we've got to overcome. But we integrate it into being a part of our life. There's a couple barriers. Look at, look at John 15, 1 through 11. Let me just read through this very quick. This is the summary that Jesus has for his disciples. He says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Remember that. I'm the true vine, my father is the gardener. Remember verse number 2. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. <coughs> Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will, be, it, it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. By the way, notice the progression. No fruit, fruit, more fruit, much fruit. We're at the much fruit part. That you bear much fruit <coughs> as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. 
if you love me, keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. There are barriers, church, that lead us, that prevent us from going from one chair to the other, that prevent us from going from lost to believing, believing to working, working to disciple maker. And there is one barrier that runs through all of these chairs and something that we have to confront and you have to get in the process and practice and the habit of confronting in your life. That's sin. That's sin. Well, we just got the church part, didn't we? That's sin. Sin is anything in your life that is not the desire of God, not the will of God, not the wants of God for creation. That's what sin is. And by the way, just about all sin can be boiled down to two jaws. I look at it as two jaws of Satan, two jaws. And all the sins we commit is just the saliva dripping off these two jaws. But these two jaws are pride and worry. And they lead. Follow your sins back to where it actually came from. It all follows back. It all flows back to these two jaws waiting to devour us, pride and worry. Sin is a barrier to going through these chairs, a barrier to producing fruit. Yes, even people who have accepted Christ have a hard time going from one place to another because of sin in their life. Why? Because they do not confess their sin. They do not address their sin. They do not repent of sin. When we confess sin, it becomes real to us. It becomes authentic. It's, a, it's an actual obstacle. Just like writing down where you are. No longer does it go in one ear and out the other. I've now made the decision. I've made the choice and I've written this down. I've confessed this sin. It's something that I need to confront. I need to deal with. We're challenged to make a change to something in our life, in our life that, that, that is something that we like, even though it might be harmful to us. Confession of sin grates upon our pride. You know what's even worse than that? When someone talks to you about confession of sin, that grates upon our pride because we realize that we're not good. Holy, yes, but not good in and of ourselves. We have this separation between us and the Father because we not have, have not revealed everything there is to know about ourselves, and we're clouding our own minds, our own hearts, our own judgment. For that reason, we don't want to go from believing to working because I sin. We don't want to go from working to making disciples because I sin. You've never confronted your sin. Get rid of your sin and leave it at the foot of the cross. No reason you can't, no reason, or there's... There's no reason you can't go from one place to another. We can't fool ourselves in confession. We can't entertain excuses in confession. And addressing and confessing our sin that we are led to, we are put, uh, this desire is put upon our hearts for continued repentance. Not continued salvation, by the way. You don't have to re-up your salvation. Continued repentance and addressing of sin and changing direction. Continued repentance is our first expression of fruit bearing. When John the Baptist was talking to the Pharisees in Matthew 3, he said this, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. When sin is confessed, a change of direction is necessary. Focus on priority is necessary. Asking for help and direction is necessary. That was the extent of my confession time this past Monday. And it was mainly confession over attitudes that I had over the past week. And I find that, look, I need help. You've you got to help me because I've been trying to change this on my own, and I can't do this. I, I need some direction. I need some help. And that's what it was. We cannot save ourselves. Why in the world do we think we can overcome sin by ourselves? Refusal to address sin is an obstacle to producing fruit. But confronting sin, confession of sin restores the mentality and even the condition of bearing fruit. James 5 says this, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. That can only come through a life of continued confession. It is necessary to bear fruit to confess before God. Because he will not take confession lightly. He will not take profession lightly. He will not receive it as empty. He will not play around with this. Did you read verse 2? Chapter 15, I told you to remember this. Chapter 15, verse 2, he cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. I'm going to read that again. He cuts off every branch in me. 
that bears no fruit. God just got serious. So we read through that very quickly. He cuts off every branch that doesn't bear fruit. No, Jesus says he cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit. And it's the separation of sin that keeps us from bearing fruit in our lives. It's the separation from sin or separation of sin that keeps us from moving from one place to another because we haven't revealed our heart to God so that we can go through this life together. That's why the pride's still there. That's why the fear's still there. I'm still hiding something. He cuts off every, by the way, that's the point where me and Dan Spader disagree. He interprets that a different way. I think he's incorrect in that, but you can read, you can read the book for that. So that's this primary barrier that runs through all of these chairs. What keeps us from going from chair two to chair three? The believer chair to the worker chair. What keeps us from wanting to be workers in the vineyard? What keeps us from wanting to bring in the harvest? You ready for this? You're not going to like it. Good things. Good things. As we said before, that believer chair is very comfortable. And there's some good things that come to our life because of that believer chair. But if you begin to prune, or if you begin to bear fruit, guess what God does? He shows up with the pruner. He starts pruning things out of your life. Why? Because he hates you? No. Stop thinking that. God doesn't prune the good things from your life because he hates you. He prunes the good things of your life because he sees you bearing fruit and wants you to bear more fruit. He is the gardener, verse 1 of chapter 15. He's the gardener, and he prunes those, verses 1 and 2. We sit, we address sin, then we sit, and we soak, and we sour. It's good to believe in Jesus. It's good to reap the benefits of this church family and this church body. There's also great things in our lives, our families, our jobs, our stations, reputations, our time, treasure, and talent, and our safety. But nowhere in Scripture does Jesus say, that's where your walk ends. Now it's the pruning time. It's the pruning process. And adults in Christ, growing in maturity in Christ, they understand that. They realize that they are saved, that they're pulled into the boat. They realize they're saved, that they're pulled out of the burning building. And what do the children do when they're saved? They sit still, stay still. What do those growing in maturity do? What do the adults do? They say, I'm saved, but there's still people who aren't. I'm going back in. I'm going back out into the field. I'm going back in to bring in the harvest. I'm going back into the burning building to save those others. That's what it is, growing in maturity, because you're being pruned, and everything that's kept you fat and happy is being cut away. I like the things that keep me fat and happy. I really do. I thank God for them. By the way, don't go home and get rid of all the good things in your life. Please don't do that today. Or if you do, don't blame me. I don't, you know, I don't care if you do, but don't blame me. That doesn't mean that you have to reject everything good in your life. It does mean that God looks at someone who is bearing fruit, and says, I'm going to help you bear even more fruit. I tend to think we get to this eternal state. We turn around and look at Jesus and say, why didn't you just take everything? This is what happened to Paul. I love it when, Paul, when, when God talks to Ananias in Acts chapter 9. The Lord said to Ananias, go, this is the man I've chosen as my instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. He didn't tell him, I'm going to show him all the great things that's going to come to him, all the great things that's going to happen to him when he plants churches around the world and writes a third of the New Testament. No, I'm going to show Paul how much he must suffer for my name. And suffer he did. And finally, what's the primary barrier that keeps us from moving from chair three? That's this worker place to chair four, making disciples, and that is satisfaction. Satisfaction leads to complacency. Satisfaction, I'm a worker in the vineyard. Satisfaction, I work in the church. Satisfaction, I preach sermons on Sunday morning. Guess I don't have to do anything else. Satisfaction, I play music or I sing on Sunday morning. Guess I don't have to do anything else. Satisfaction, I teach a, I teach a Sunday school class. I guess I don't have to do anything else. I'm good, that's it. That's the end of my walk. Satisfaction, complacency, serious barrier to going into this disciple-making process. We are going to celebrate Thanksgiving pretty soon. And Thanksgiving is a time to celebrate the harvest. Actually, it's time of day of prayer and celebrate the harvest. You've worked. You've been out in the field. You've seen the results. So celebrate. Celebrate the next day if you want to and the day after that. But eventually, you're going to have to get back to the barn. Eventually, you're going to have to get back and start repairing, maintaining, preparing equipment. You're going to need to get back to work, learn from the past year, increase your yield, make adjustments, acquisitions, sell off, modify ground. 
You can do all of that. You, you can celebrate if you want, but eventually you've got to get back to work. The job's not done. And that's what the disciple maker understands. The disciple maker understands the job's not done. And I'm going to finish strong. Renew Lynn, you've heard that a million times. Finish strong. I'm going to finish strong. That's the disciple maker. And finally, what's this last barrier? You know, we start off as children, children in our spiritual walk as we believe in Jesus Christ. And then we grow and we grow and we mature and we mature as we go through these processes that lead us to this worker stage. We grow some more, we grow some more. And, and eventually we go from child to sort of young adult and then from young adult to maybe parent as we're reproducing or grandparent as we're reproducing. And yet this biggest barrier that keeps us from going from one chair to the next, from chair three to chair four, is we refuse to be childlike. We refuse to embrace what it is to be childlike. We grow, church. This will be our secret. We grow in wisdom as we age. We grow in knowledge as, as we, as we, as we you know, mature in Christ, all these things. Sometimes we grow in, in foolishness. Sometimes we grow in stupidity. Sometimes we grow in, in, in fear sometimes. We give up on this childlike mentality. You, you, ever, you ever watch these kids when it comes to come and see? They don't care. Hey, come and see. They go to Satan himself and say, come and see. You got to come and see where Jesus lives. This incredible faith, this incredible trust, this desire, this, this excitement that they have. Because you got to get to that point. We have to get to that point, back to this childlike mentality of a complete faith and trust in our Father and then fearlessness as we go through this world, as we make disciples, as we teach, as we instruct, as we serve, as we love, for all the things we do in the kingdom of Christ. <coughs> it's went a lot longer than I thought. Let's, uh, let's thank God for our time, and then we'll be, uh, we'll be challenged here in just a moment. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the love that you've given us. We thank you, Father, that you continue to challenge us to grow and to be more. We thank you, Father, that, that you will that you will weed us out, that you will cut away those branches that do not produce fruit. Father, we thank you that it, it, it encourage us to grow in strength and work in the vineyard and, and, and building the kingdom. We thank you, Father, that you have given not just us this existence, but a mission, a purpose to live out while we're here, that others may come to know Christ the way we do that others may be saved, that others may look at Jesus, look at the cross and say, yes, the work's done, the war is won, I accept the truth of Christ. <coughs> Father, we ask that you give us the tools that we need, that you equip us to work, that you give us the desire we need, that you give us the, the, the want, the craving as we look upon the lost person, that they may live forever, to know that they are beautifully and wonderfully and fearfully made. We thank you for this challenge. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing.
Church, I encourage you very strongly to be here next week. We have a testimony being given by somebody in the church. Uh, you're going to love it. It's, it's going to be a very important part as we go into a season of gratitude. I do, we are going to unleash a challenge here very soon uh, as we revamp some of our goals. And this is going to be family to family. And this is the second challenge for you today. Be thinking about this. Your family, whether you're a family of one or a family of 20, is going to be challenged to connect to another family that you know. And you're going to have them, you're going to ask them to come and see where Jesus lives. Come and see where Jesus lives. It might be around your table. And this is really where this started from. It might be you bringing that family around your table. It might be bringing that family into this place. But each family is going to be charged, it's going to be challenged with introducing another family to where Jesus lives. Uh, we're going to start that a little bit later on when we also re-kick off some financial goals and a few other things. But we're going to go into our disciple-making process very, very seriously. We've put together a couple of plans, and they, I think it'll be, uh, it'll be a challenge, but it should be fun. So make sure that you're thinking about that as soon as we launch that, family to family. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you, Father, for the, that you have placed us here because you love us and you care about us. We have brothers and sisters in Christ around us. We thank you, Father, that you challenge us. We thank you, Father, that the kingdom of God is built right here in this place and extends from this place right here, that we have the opportunity to add to that harvest, to work in that vineyard, to add to that kingdom, Father. Please challenge us to do more than just exist. Challenge us to be this incredible worker in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.